Isaiah 55, 9. This is a wonderful passage that I've often uh, made reference to, to gain perspective or to be comforted by lack of perspective. Um, it says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And this, of course, is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. So today is our annual business meeting, and so we're going to be here a little longer today. Those who will can stay and be a part of it. And so I intend to keep my message a little bit shorter than usual this morning. Um, what, I, what I wanted to do was just maybe give you insight into some of the things I've been meditating on over the last number of weeks. As we go forward in our Christian life, um, I often ask God, what are you saying to me? And, and of course, that leads to all sorts of different things as, as I listen. But this is something that I've been meditating on, and, um, and we'll just see where it finds place in your lives today. Um, creation. We all know that God is creative. Isn't that nice? Not only is God the creator of all things, but His creation displays a vast array of creativity. Wouldn't you agree? Just the number of, of species and, and uh, within each species, not only numbers, but the differences and the variation of each of them and, and the beauty. But there's an orderly side to God as well. When God creates, He does so in sequence. Genesis chapter 1 illustrates this. We know that the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth and the sixth, God kept layering upon uh, or adding more and more to His creation. First He created it and then He filled it and, and so on. And so the narrative of Genesis illustrates God's order of things when He creates. But not only that, Reve the book of Le Revelation, the last book of the Bible, illustrates that even in judgment, God works in an orderly sequence. And so I'm not reflecting on creation today or judgment per se, only the fact that our creative God works in sequence. To Him there's an order in things. And He always works in that way. Uh, when Adam and Eve succumbed to temptation and sin, thus alienating themselves from God, God set in motion a plan of reconciliation, a way that they could be brought back into relationship with them, and that would be their redemption. And God said very in the early chapters of Genesis that he would crush the serpent's head, and so on. And then Paul in the New Testament writes, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. In the fullness of time, in other words, Jesus didn't come for thousands of years after Adam and Eve, because there was an order of things, a sequence of things that God wanted to um, fulfill. And so we have, of course, the calling of Israel as the apple of God's eye. We have the prophets who, who foretold events to come. And there was this intentionality in redemption. But again, I'm not teaching about the birth of Jesus today. I'm simply underscoring the fact that God works in priority sequence and then asking myself a question, what does this mean for our lives? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, we are instructed to imitate God in our life. And so at least on one level, if we're to follow God's example, if we're to become more like God, imitate God in His ways, we need to live out our lives in view of priority sequences in a certain order of things. You following with me? Jesus calls us to do good works. We know that. But if you are trying to achieve your salvation, your relationship with the Lord through the things you're doing, you're out of priority sequence. First things first. It says in Ephesians 2, chapter or verses 8 and 9, that it's by grace that we're saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we are God's workmanship created to do good works. So you come to faith first, and then you demonstrate your relationship to God by doing good works. It's not the other way around. There is an order of things. We all understand that, right? Now Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 
Jesus' words, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So here's what humans typically do in our culture. We go about, as a matter of priority, seeking to meet our own needs. We want the stuff, we want the opportunities, we want the intimate relationships. It's all about seeking those things. But Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and those other things will come to you. It's about priority sequence. What does the Lord require of us in terms of seeking the first the kingdom of God? Micah 6, 8, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. So, what does this look like now in our lives? To live our lives in priority sequence, in an order of things that, that is consistent with the nature of God and our call to follow His example. Have you ever, when you come to church, wondered, why is our service like it is? Why, why do we always start off the service with these, these clapping loud songs and then, and then as it goes to the tail, like, is there, is, there any method, is there any method to the madness or is there a reason for it? And I was talking with Lori earlier on how everybody has their preferences and I hear from everybody what they would like or dislike. And if I listened to everyone, we wouldn't have a service at all because it's everybody likes something different and doesn't like something else and I just go, I'm caught in the vortex. What does living our lives in priority sequence look like when it comes to our worship? Psalm 95 verse 6 says, or not Psalm 95 verse 6, let's go back to Psalm 100. It says that we're to enter his gates with thanksgiving in our heart and into his courts with praise. So there's an intentionality when we come together. That when we come, we follow the the. the the metaphor of the tabernacle that was established in ancient times with the people of Israel, they entered courts and they went further into this temple, this tabernacle, to a place of worship. So they enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Praise is an excited boasting about the things that the Lord has done. It requires energy, it requires output. It's, it's as, as David said, um, enter his presence with singing and joyful songs. All right? So we, we, we come into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And it's with the intent to awaken our souls. To make our souls, our inner spirit alive. And to quicken it. But then we move deeper and we go to Psalm 95 verse 6 where it says, Come and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our, our maker, and we are going to worship. And so we enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, and into his presence with worship, it's priority sequence, it's an order of things that the Lord has set. And so we try to model our worship service after that. Does that make sense to you? It's not just whatever feels good. What does this look like, this priority sequence thing, this order of things, in terms of our, our giving? Well, Abraham was the first to give God a tenth of his possessions. And he did this in response to God's blessing. Jacob, um, one of his grandchildren, had an encounter God with, through a dream and a response gives God a tenth of his possessions. Again, because of what God had given him, it seemed like an appropriate response back. Under Moses, that first tenth begins to be called a tithe. And it's to be set aside to the Lord as something that's holy unto the Lord and it becomes a command. God begins to command his people that you're to take the tenth of your earnings, whatever you, your crops, whatever your, your, your source of income is, your livestock, and you're to give it back to the Lord. And it was in Deuteronomy 14, it's called the first fruits. And so in the order of things, the sequence of things, it's not to be done last out of the leftovers, it's to be the first thing that you do. The first fruits. <coughs> So the very first thing we do is when we get income, we give the first tenth to the Lord. We work hard, we gather, we receive, and then we give our first, our best, to the Lord. Malachi 3 says it's to be brought to the storehouse. What does that mean? It means it's to be brought to the place that's designated for receiving your tithes and for being used to support the faith community and needs in your community. And then Solomon highlighted this practice as the principle of plenty. In other words, as you are faithful, God will bless you. As you seek first the kingdom of God, you will be surprised how God meets all your other needs. 
He says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits of all your produce, and then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And so there's a sequence of things. It's the first that you give, and then you meet your, your personal needs after that. Malachi challenges God's people to test God in that, to see if God will not be faithful and open up the windows of heaven and bless them if they do that. And he says, if you don't give the first tenth, Malachi calls us out and says that we're robbing God. And so we understand that there's a sequence of things, and there's a first when it comes to our income and giving. And then there's something called offerings. Now, offerings are something that's totally separate from your first tenth, and it's something to come that, that you give to different needs out of the extra margin in your life. So you give your tenth, you meet the needs of your family appropriately, and whatever's left over, you can discern as God leads you, is completely voluntary, to give offerings. And that is the paradigm of Scripture. And Jesus said, all of this is to be done in secret. You don't do it as before the Lord. The only people that know what you give in this church is boy. And that's because he does the tax receipts and the accounting. Nobody else knows. I don't know. And I make it not my business to know. But when we don't do that, we are out of step with the nature and character of God. We are called to imitate Him, to be like God, and God works in terms of an order of things, a sequence of priorities. Now, a very unpopular subject for a pastor these days is what does this look like in our pursuit of intimate relationships? Pastors are like voices crying in the wilderness on this one these days. We really are. See, Hebrews 13 verse 4 makes it clear that sexual encounters are only appropriate within the context of marriage. People have a hard time hearing that, but I let the Bible speak for itself. In the order of things, biblically, there was courtship, betrothal, which is um, like an engagement now, there was marriage, and then there was the sexual encounter. People say, well, the God's a killjoy. Well, he's, he's actually not a killjoy. There's pow powerful reasons for this, and I often refer to the kite illustration. I ask uh, people, what is it that holds a kite in the air? And they always say, well, it's the wind. And it's not that at all. It's actually the string. You let go of the string and the kite crashes, right? The very thing that's holding the kite down is actually holding the kite up. And that's, and that's the way it is with God. He's given us parameters for living our life and while we perceive them to be holding us down, they're actually holding us up and protecting us from damaging ourselves and our culture. I asked the university students the other night, and we had quite a discussion about it, what is sex? What is sex? And remember P Bill Clinton? I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> well, we all know what happened, but I did not have sexual relations. Well, his definition, and most of our understanding is quite different, right? He was just trying to cover himself. But the students concluded that anything that causes arousal. For some students, it might be holding hands. Others, it might be kissing. I don't know, he, but Paul admonishes that we need to avoid that until marriage, and if you can't, then get married, because you're going to burn with passion. So this is an unpopular subject, and I get it, because we all want what we want, but as we stand back and we look at it, it's about aligning our lives with the character and nature of God, who has told us to live out our lives in priority sequence. There's an order of things in which things are to happen. And... Uh, you know, Song of Solomon talks about, do not awaken my love before it pleases. And God says, it's not meant to happen until marriage. Well, I had a crazy thing come into my understanding. I don't know how else to word it this week, but, and I talked to Susie about this. I said, if somebody came to our door, and grandparents and children, and parents, listen to this one. This puts it in pretty, it's crystallizes it. If somebody came to your door and they had a huge box and it was filled with uh, pornographic magazines, it was filled, and they said, um, this, these are for your kids. Can you take them and give them to your kids? What would you say? No, they're not ready for that. It's inappropriate. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. <laughs> you wouldn't take it and give it to them. And yet, how many of us give our kids computers with full access to the internet?
I'm telling you, it's more than a big box. It's not hard, it's not easy to be a parent. But your job is not to be popular, it's to be their parent and to guard their hearts and not to awaken love before it pleases. So, my mom, being the astute lady that she is, wonders what I'm going to say as I talk about this subject, knows that when I was in grade 11, I had a girlfriend from Alberta. Right? And I was a normal, healthy, sorry Susie, young adolescent boy. And I would bring her home after school and we would go down into my bedroom and my mom would come down and open up the door. And I'd say, Mom, what do you do? She goes, Douglas, it's appropriate to have the door open when you have a young lady here. Why? Don't you trust me? And I would carry on like this. Don't you trust me? She goes, it's appropriate to have the door open when you have a long leg. You don't trust me. Douglas, it's too much temptation. I don't trust anybody in these circumstances. And I'm thinking to myself as I carry on and put up a fuss with my mom that she's pretty sharp. She knows, doesn't she? Yes, sometimes. The thing of it is, folks, as we come to understand God, we have to understand that He's not only creative, but there's a deliberate order of things. And we must understand that even though we're Christians, there are times in our life when we actually are living in opposition to God. We're making ourselves, we're putting ourselves in a position to be opposed to God. And Romans 13 verse 2 says, we are opposing what God has set in place. And thus opposing himself. The Gamaliel principle in Acts 5. When we get things out of order, we're fighting God. He didn't say, well, I'm not against God. But when we live our lives out of priority sequence, we are setting ourselves in opposition to the one who's giving us all things. We need to seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to us. If our life is filled with confusion, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. It's a telltale sign that we need to bring our lives into alignment with the nature and character of God. And so this is meant to help you, not chastise you. It's meant to motivate you, motivate all of us to live in harmony with God. Well, sometimes you wonder what's going on in the heart and mind of your pastor. Mm -hmm. These are the things I've been meditating on just recently. That God does things in sequence. And we need to honor those sequences and align ourselves with God. It's hard. But God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, help us to understand these principles. Help us to not only understand, but to be wise and to want to live them out in our lives. It is tough in our culture, which is saturating us and our children with all sorts of junk that's really from, uh, from the depths meant to, uh, meant to paralyze us in guilt and fear and all sorts of things. But God, help us to be alive in you and to want to remain alive in you by having a heart for you and to live holy. Uh, I thank you for young couples I've known that have honored uh, these principles. And you've blessed them. And for those who haven't, I know that you forgive, but help them going forward to honor you in all aspects of their life. For you've given us this life, and now we need to live it out in view of being grateful and honoring you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.